Good morning, church. It's so good to see all of you all this morning. Um, our scripture comes from Mark 8, starting on 36. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Uh, my Bible goes on to say that Jesus told his disciples that his ministry would lead to suffering and death, and there would be no resurrection if there were no cross. Jesus had to suffer to overcome the power of sin in our world. We should be grateful that Jesus has already paid the price for our sins. And when we admit our failures and accept God's forgiveness, we can be sure that God will free us from the destructive hold of sin. Amen. I ask you to stand and sing with me this morning. There is something about that name. Guys, good morning to you. Good morning. Guys, it is good to see you. It has been weird to not be up here uh, the past two weeks. So I know that you guys have heard uh, from some good folks. Kevin, thank you for filling in last Sunday. Uh, I appreciate Tim Turner, who was here a couple of weeks ago. So I know you guys did hear from God's Word. I'm always appreciative of that. Uh, if you ever come to this church and do not hear God's Word, don't come here. I don't mean that mean. I really don't mean that silly. Like, you need to go to a church that preaches God's Word because that's what it's about. We can only find truth there. So I'm looking forward to being uh, back here today, be able to share from God's Word with you guys. Uh, it was good to be away for a little bit, but it's also good to be back. So I hope that you guys uh, are having a good morning, uh, and I hope that you guys are blessed from being able to be here with us today. Uh, I do want to remind you of a few things that we've got going on. Usually our announcements at this point are, don't forget next Sunday at 9 and 11, but we've got a few more things that uh, to announce some things that we're trying to work through. Uh, don't forget our Bible study on Wednesdays. We are still doing that as live stream at the moment. Uh, so don't forget about that. Facebook at 630. If you need any help with that, if you want to uh, have questions about how to access that, I'd be more than happy to try to help you with that. Uh, we are going to be finishing our study in Matthew this week, and then we're going to be looking at the book of Hebrews after that. So uh, if you guys uh, have any questions on that, I'd be more than happy to try to answer those for you. Uh, also, we're going to have uh, a brief meeting this evening uh, for our youth director and our um, children's director and any volunteers that would like to come to the meeting at 7 tonight, uh, trying to talk about what are some ways to, to brainstorm some ideas of what we can do uh, to reach our children and our youth that's different than what we're doing right now. Because uh, we currently don't, of course, have our children's ministry going on. We don't have Sunday school, uh, children's church, all those kinds of things. So uh, if anyone would like to volunteer to help with that, feel free to meet tonight at 7. We're going to talk about some different ideas of what we can do uh, to minister. Uh, one thing I do want to give an update, Kevin had made an announcement for me last week uh, that the Men and Boys Retreat was going to be coming up in September. Uh, the camp that that is hosted at has decided that that is not something they are going to do, so that event has been canceled. Uh, so just a reminder of that for you guys. Um, 
Also, we are going to be having a church business meeting on August the 30th. Now, one of the things you may have enjoyed from this different season in the online for a while is that we haven't had any business meetings for like the entire year almost. Uh, but we are going to have one on August the 30th just to give us an update of where things are at. Uh, we are good. There's nothing to be alarmed there. But I just want to give you guys some information on that. That's going to be on August the 30th uh, at 6 p.m. here at the building. Same things as for morning service. Make sure that you've got uh, masks and keep good distancing, okay? Um, the last thing that I have for you is uh, last Sunday, what that usually would have been for us uh, was a youth Sunday. And we would have done like a whole afternoon of games and different things, back to school stuff. Uh, we would have had an evening service where we prayer walk to the schools. Uh, I imagine that no school would like people that they have no idea where they've been to in the last few weeks to just start walking through their halls. Uh, to pray. And so uh, it's not that we can give up on praying for our schools because perhaps they need it now more than ever. Uh, so what we would like to do in order to try to provide a space for that is we're going to have a week of prayer here at the church. It's going to start on August the 31st, which is a Monday. And end on September the 4th, which is a Friday. That's supposed to be the first week uh, that places are going to be back in school. So we're going to have the building open every evening from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. for people to come in and just to have some moments of prayer. Now, you don't have to start at 7 and end at 8. You could start at 7.15 and end at 7.30, whatever you'd like to do. Come and go. Again, make sure to uh, do distancing. Make sure to be smart uh, with that. But we want to make sure we are lifting up our teachers, our students, the faculty, uh, and prayer, all of us really don't know what the opening of school is going to look like. We just don't know if we're going to be quite honest with it, uh, but we can trust an unknown future to a known God, and that's exactly what we want to do. Uh, so I want to encourage you guys, uh, please make sure that you make use of that. Come some evening, come every evening if you want. Uh, let's lift up our teachers and our students in prayer for the beginning of this year. Now that's the last of the announcements that I do have for you. Uh, what I want to do is I want to just take our service to a time of prayer. Uh, I know that all of you have different concerns, different things that are heavy on your hearts, and I just want to take a moment to lift all of those to the Lord. Uh, after I do that, we're going to have a moment of meditation for you just to spend some time talking to God uh, yourself. So let's go ahead and ask the Lord to move and work in us and in our service today. Let's pray. God, as we come before you this morning, God, we thank you for another day that you've given to us. Oh God, what a gift. God, we know that this season has so many question marks, uh, things that we don't understand, uh, but God, we can trust you. And God, I pray that you would help us to do that. Father, to do that individually with the things that we're all facing, uh, the things that only we know uh, that's going on in our lives. God, I pray that you would uh, just remind us that you're present with us. God, help us to lean on you. Help us to look for your will in our situations. God, collectively as a church, continue to guide us. Uh, God, we pray for your provision. We pray for your protection. God, we pray uh, just for wisdom in the days that come. God, we pray in this service that you would move and that you would work uh, in us. God, we would hear from your word. We'd be encouraged by it. And God, we would learn from it. God, I pray that uh, although this world has changed, your commands to us have not. Uh, the job that you have given us to do has not changed. And I pray that you will find us being faithful to do that job until you return. God, in this day and everything we say and everything that we do, may you be glorified. God, we thank you and ask these things in the name of Jesus. And amen.
Jonathan sent me a text and uh, asked for this song this week, and even though it's not the one he normally asks for, it uh, it is a song that normally the choir sings, and uh, so, you know, he's texting me, and he you know, gives me the name of it, and then he texts me a few lines, and I'm thinking, thank goodness he's texting me and not singing them to me because, you know, Jeff says Jonathan sings in the key of Jonathan, so you know what that means. Uh, so Friday night I came by the church and was practicing this uh, song a couple times, and I got to thinking, man, I miss this choir. I miss choir practice, and I miss all of my choir people, and I cannot wait for the day when we're back up here and singing together again and so I uh, don't know what this will sound like just me by myself so all you choir people sitting out there you can help me sing this today.
Good morning again, church. Um, If you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew uh, chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Now, we spent a lot of time in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 uh, listening to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Uh, So we are are skipping quite a bit ahead from where we were, uh, but this is where I believe Jesus has us for uh, today. Uh, Now, when I left you, some of the words that you last heard from me came from Matthew chapter 7, verse 14, uh, and they are this. It says, For the gate is narrow, and the way uh, is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. That's one of the last words from scriptures that uh, I shared with you. I want you to understand uh, today, this is really the main thrust of what I have for you today, is that if a person is going to follow Jesus, it is not going to be a risk-free life. If a person is going to follow Jesus according to the words of Jesus himself, it is not going to be a risk-free life. Now, what do I mean by that? When we talk about the Merriam-Webster definition uh, of the word risk, it is the possibility of loss or injury, the possibility of loss or injury. I think that we spend so much of our time uh, trying to prevent, if you will, loss or injury. Uh, We try to limit the number of risks that we have in our life. It's a natural instinct that we have. But here's what's interesting about the passage we're going to read in a few moments is that Jesus informs us that if we're going to follow him, loss is not just a possibility, it is a certainty for those who follow Jesus. Now, before we do get to our passage, I want to spend a moment uh, to address what the world would tell us at the moment uh, is the biggest risk to our lives. I want to spend just a moment uh, there, and that I'm sure you guys may already be aware of, uh, maybe you've heard of it. Uh, I'm going to speak just a moment to the coronavirus, okay, just, just for a moment. So uh, the next slide that I want to present, before uh, I share this information, I want to tell you why I'm sharing this information. Uh, this comes from the CDC. It comes from America's HealthRankings.org, the National Highway Traffic Safety uh, Administration. And there's one source on there that comes from me, and I will share that in a moment. The thing about all the statistics except for one is that we know those. Those come from data. Those come from things that uh, we can read, we can look at. Uh, So I'm going to explain those to you. What I want us to get from this slide is that every single one of us is going to face death. We just don't know in what shape it's going to come. Okay? So let's spend just a moment. This is just for the state of West Virginia. This is not nationally. This is not for the world. This is just for the state of West Virginia. The homicide rate for West Virginia is 5.8 people per 100,000. Now, I don't know what a 0.8 of a person looks like, but that, of course, is how, you know, how the numbers get calculated and how, how that works. So the homicide rate for West Virginia is if we were to fill this place with 100,000 people, 5.8 of them would um, be killed by a homicide. Okay. The next is occupational uh, fatality. So 8.6 people. If we had 100,000 people in here, 8.6 of them would die from something at work. Okay, they they would die from a work-related injury. Uh, The next one that we see on here is COVID-19. Now, currently, this is for the information we have now. Uh, To make sure that I'm fair with this, we do not know what the end of this year is going to look like. We don't know what after schools is going to uh, open, what that's going to look like. But as things currently sit with 160 deaths for the state of West Virginia, with the estimated population of 1.8 million, That means your chances of death for every 100,000 people is 8.8 people for the state of West Virginia at this moment. Uh, Now, we would have to more than double the amount of deaths that we have currently to get up to the traffic fatality level or higher, okay, which could possibly happen. We do not know. That's an uncertainty for us. The firearm death uh, would be 18.2. For for every 100,000 people, 18.2 people are going to die from uh, a gun death because, you know, West West Virginians, we like our guns. We like to hunt. Uh, Traffic fatalities. Now, uh, in first service, we had a person that just got their license, okay? So I don't don't know if this might have have scared them or not. I don't know. But traffic fatalities, 20.5 people for every 100 Thousand. Now, this is not an accident. This is not a person that might lose an arm or become a, a, a paraplegic or something from an accident. This is just a fatality would be 20.5 people for every 100,000. Suicide is higher than everything else we've mentioned so far. 
uh, suicide, 21.2 people for every 100,000 West Virginians. Alzheimer's, 31 people for every 100,000. A drug overdose, that of course, is larger than anything else we've seen so far, 51.5 per every 100,000 people will die in West Virginia because of a drug overdose. Heart disease overshadows all of them, 196.4 people for 100,000. Now, the top statistic is not on the CDC. It's not uh, by traffic control. It's not from any other source. This is from me, okay, so I'll take credit. I've got it on bold. I'll, I'll make sure you know that. Every single person, all 100,000 all 100, people of West Virginia are going to die. Okay? All 100,000 out of 100,000 are going to die of something. So what I want us to understand this morning is that the biggest threat to us, according to the text we're going to look at today, is not COVID-19. The biggest threat today is not COVID-19. In fact, it is self preservation. The biggest threat to us today is self-preservation. Now, Pastor, what, what, what do you mean by that? Again, let's, let's borrow Merriam-Webster for just a moment. The definition of self-preservation is this, the preservation of oneself from destruction or harm, a natural or instinctive tendency to act so as to preserve one's own existence. So this definition is that by our own nature, we go out of our way to spend time, to spend effort, a lot of time, a lot of effort to, to take care of ourselves, to, to prevent ourselves from risk, to prevent ourselves from harm. So much of our time and energy is absorbed on us. To say it another way, we spend more time trying not to die than preparing for the death that is inevitable for each and every one of us. So death is going to come to all 100% of everybody that is in existence in the state of West Virginia, in the nation, and in the world. Here's the thing. Death is coming. I don't want to sugarcoat that. I don't want to sound like a doomsday person. I just want to be real for a moment. Death is coming to everyone. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 tells us this. is appointed for man to die once and then to face judgment. See, the truth is that every single one of us has earned death. According to the scriptures, every single one of us has earned death. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Romans 3 23, and all of us have sinned. So all of us have earned death. In fact, when we die, we are receiving a just punishment for, disobe for disobeying God. This is what the scriptures would tell us. And yet we understand physical death is not the end for us. There is more to this story. So let's see what Jesus has to tell us about this in chapter 16, starting in verse 21 today. Chapter 16, starting in verse 21, it says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and to be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels and the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his judgment. So what I want you to understand, what I want you to take away from everything we're going to say today is that the biggest threat to you, according to Jesus, is not COVID-19, but it is self-preservation. If that's the biggest threat, what is the remedy for us not to be so hung up on ourselves and our safety well, I think it goes something like this. We have to hear God's word. 
we have to listen to God's word, and we have to choose God's, well, I said word, but will over our own. So we have to hear God's will, we have to listen to God's will, and we have to choose God's will over our own. I think that's what Jesus has for us in this passage today. Uh, The first, we see this in verse 21. Now, at this point, Jesus has done tremendous things. I mean, Jesus has healed more people than we can literally count, okay? He has fed thousands of people in miraculous fashion. He has taught in ways that have uh, just messed with the minds of the supposedly smartest people of the day. Jesus has done tremendous things, but in this moment, in verse 21, Jesus is going to share something with his disciples that he has not shared up to this moment. He's going to reveal the full will of God for him. Up to this moment, it's been healing. Up to this moment, it's been miraculous feeding. Up to this moment, it's been miraculous teaching. And now Jesus is going to say, here is the full plan that God has for me. And notice what it includes. There are three things that we find out are God's will for Jesus in this passage. And it says this, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. God's will for Jesus, the first thing in this verse, is that he must suffer, is the first will of God for Jesus in this verse. The second thing is to be killed. His life will be ended when he goes to Jerusalem. And the third is that he will be raised. And this is the first of four times he will share this with his disciples in the gospel of Matthew. But this is the first time they've ever heard it. This is the first time the miraculous plans of God, the miraculous kingdom of God, is more than just a healing or miraculous meal. This is where God is sharing something with them he has not shared with them yet. Now, when we look at these three things, the last thing doesn't sound bad, okay? Uh, Be raised sounds pretty good, but the first two sound awful, if we're honest. The first two sound awful. He must suffer. Be killed. Now, th- there's no questions about this. Jesus has spoke on behalf of God throughout the Gospel of Matthew. He's been pointing people to understand him as the very voice of God among them. And so th- it's not a question of whether they have heard God's will. It's a question of what they're going to do in response to it. So the will is to suffer, to be killed, to be raised. Now, two-thirds of God's plan is something we would never pick for ourselves. Two-thirds of God's plan here is something that none of us desire and none of us would personally want. But the first step for them to not be centered on themselves is to hear that this is the plan of God. Now, I want you to notice what Peter does here. I think Peter does what we instinctively do here is he rejects the will of God. He does nothing short or less than that. Peter rejects and refuses to listen to what God's will is in this next verse. In verse 22, it says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, I just picture it like this. Peter has, takes Jesus off to the side. Uh, now, you know, they were talking amongst the disciples. They were talking amongst a group of people. And maybe you've been in this situation before where one of your friends said something a little too outlandish or said something that maybe was, you thought was inappropriate. And you're like, let's, let's go talk <laughs> for a second. You know, maybe a kid did something you need to correct them. And you're like, let's take them out for a moment. This is what Peter does to Jesus. Peter takes Jesus to the side to rebuke him. Now, I want you to understand rebuke kind of sounds like puke, okay? It's a, it's a correction, and it is not a pleasant one, okay? A, a rebuke is not a pleasant correction. If you sound, say correction, it sounds uh, nicer or smooth. Peter brings Jesus to the side to say, Jesus, you cannot talk like that in front of the guys. Jesus, you, you can't talk like that. You're going to crush their spirits. Death, what are you talking about? Suffering? What are you talking about? Jesus, you're supposed to bring the kingdom of God. What about the healings? What about the good meals? What about all of this? Jesus, you can't mention death. You're going to break this movement from its beginning. Jesus, you, you, you just, <laughs> that cannot be part of the plan. This is what Peter is saying to Jesus. Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. So this is not that Peter has not heard the distinct will of God, is that Peter does not want what the will of God is. 
Now, it's hard for us to pinpoint exactly what Peter's reasons for this reaction to Jesus are, but I think it's a mixture of a few things. I think it's a mixture of genuine concern, of self-preservation, and even a dash of self-promotion. Uh, the first is, is genuine concern. Listen, if you have someone that you love, you don't want someone that you love to be hurt. You never wish for harm for someone that you love and care for. We know that Jesus loved his disciples and his disciples loved him. We know that even within the, the group of disciples, there were people, uh, a few that were closer to Jesus than others. And Peter is one of those people. Uh, after all, when Jesus called to the disciples uh, to have faith to step out of the boat, Peter's the only one that did that. Peter and Jesus are close. There is a connection here. It's not that they're not friends. Part of what Peter is saying is, listen, if you're saying harm's going to come to you, they're going to have to go through me first. Part of this is genuine concern for Jesus. But part of it is also self-preservation. You see, Peter's life is now riding on Jesus' success. Uh, Peter has left everything, according to the scriptures, to follow Jesus. He's left a fishing business behind. He's left uh, friends and family behind. And so part of Jesus, or Peter's success rides on the success of Jesus. Peter likely looked forward to playing an important role in the kingdom of God. After all, in those chapters in Matthew, we see the apostles arguing over who's the greatest. We see one of the mothers of them coming up and say, uh, can my kids sit closest to you? When it comes to the kingdom, uh, Peter likely, he, he, he's expecting some kind of success. He's expecting when the kingdom of God comes, which is supposed to have no end, he's going to have one of the best seats in the house for the kingdom that is never supposed to have an expiration date. But all of that is going to go away if the leader, Jesus, has something happen to him. And so likely part of his rebuke here is, uh, Jesus, we're, we're not giving up on this movement just yet. Uh, that's going to mean something bad for me if this all goes south. The Greek phrase of this uh, produces even a stronger reaction out of Peter, as if Peter is committed actively to working against God's revealed will, as if Peter himself is going to intervene and not let these things happen to Jesus. A flash forward for a moment to the Garden of Gethsemane. We understand that a person pulled a sword and cut off the ear of one of the people there. The scriptures tell us that that was Peter, okay? And so we have this idea. Peter's like, I will intervene and keep harm from coming to you. So what we must understand here is hearing God's will is not enough. Peter has heard it. Peter has heard God's will from the Son of God himself. It's just that he doesn't like what he's hearing. Uh, perhaps you as a parent have said this. Perhaps you've heard it from a parent or uh, from a teacher. Uh, you have heard that hearing is different from listening, right? You've heard that hearing something is different uh, than listening. I want to give you the example. If your spouse tells you to take out the trash, it is not enough for you to say, yeah, I heard that. Okay. If you say, yeah, I heard that, and you still watch the TV and don't take the trash out, people are not going to be very happy in the household, okay? Because you heard, but listening includes that you get up and you take the trash out. Anything less than obedience to what has been asked is going to be considered a failure of what has been asked. So Peter has heard the will of God, but he certainly has not listened to it. So the next step for us, in order for us to abandon our, self, uh, our, our self-promotion, if you will, or uh, to abandon our desire uh, for self-preservation, is that we're going to have to listen to uh, the will of God. Now, here's what happens here. He says, he turned and he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Now, I'm, I'm not really completely up to date on all the insults that you can throw at a person, but I'm pretty sure that this is about the highest insult that can come from Jesus. Okay? He turns to Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan. Jesus corrects Peter because here's what's on the line. Anytime we fail to listen to the will of God, we are listening to the will of Satan. Anytime we are not listening to the will of God, we are listening to the will of Satan. Now, I want to take you back for a moment. Uh, I, I mean, Peter is a, is a pretty normal person. Uh, let's go back for just a moment to chapter 16, 
verses 16 through 18. I'll take you back there for just a moment. It says, So Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is the highest moment in Peter's life, and this happens just moments before the conversation we are discussing in our text today. Peter is the first person out of the disciples to see Jesus for who he really is. He says, you are the Christ. You're not a prophet. You're not just a good teacher. You are the savior of the world. You're the Messiah we are looking for. And Jesus praises him for seeing God's will for Jesus. God, he praises him. He says, listen, you have, have seen this from my father. My father has revealed it to you. He even tells Peter, you're going to be instrumental in the beginning of of the church. So just a moment before our conversation, Peter is listening and being obedient to the will of God. And then just moments later, he refuses to listen to what God wants him to say. Now, I, there's a lesson there for us. We can have one hour we're listening to the, the, the voice of God, and the next hour we have completely forgotten the goodness of who God is. We have been distracted and we are in fear of what just came into our lap for that next moment, forgetting completely the, where we were with God just an hour previously, right? Anyone else ever experienced that? We, we see this happening for Peter here. What Jesus wants him to understand is we have to constantly be hearing, constantly be listening. Here's what he says. He says, you are a hindrance to me. Listen, if you want to hinder your life, you stop listening to God's will and you just see where that takes you. You just see where that takes you. N notice what he says. He says, For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. See, Peter is all about his own self-preservation in this passage. In this moment, he has turned from looking to Jesus to looking at himself. See, that's what we do. The things of man is the only think of ourself. John Wesley put it this way. He says, the advice of the world and the flesh and the devil is this, favor me. Paul in Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, like Peter, all of us need our mind renewed to hear and to listen to the will of God because sometimes we hear it and we just don't want it because it's not what we have envisioned for ourselves. Here's the thing that Jesus is going to do. He doesn't think Peter just needs to be corrected on this. He thinks all of his disciples need to be corrected on this. So Jesus brings Peter back into the disciples and he has this discussion with them. This wasn't just a temptation for Peter. It'd be a temptation for all the disciples and for all of us. In verses 24 through 25, it's not enough for us to hear. It's not enough for us to listen. We have to choose the will of God over our own as the constant pattern for our lives. Remember that Jesus said the goal was to enter through the narrow gate by following him. So here Jesus is going to reveal what that cost is in doing so. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus speaks to our deepest need. He says self-preservation is a death sentence for your life. And trying to keep your life uh, extended and trying to make everything safe as possible, you will actually find yourself on the road to death. If you're to find life, you're going to have to pick up your cross and follow me. Now, out of all the metaphors that Jesus has used so far, this is the hardest for his disciples to understand. When he talked about uh, the teaching of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, he's like, it's like a little leaven or a little yeast that got put into bread. And they understood that metaphor. He talked about him taking care of the birds of the sky. He talked about lots of different things that they could understand, like a sower that was going out and sowing the seed. They understood those metaphors. They were not prepared for this one. 
Jesus says, in order for you to find life, the metaphor I'm going to use is the cross. Now, the cross was the, the most hated and despicable form of death in that day. In fact, in all the ages of history, it's hard for us to think of a form of death that is worse than the cross. And yet Jesus uses this as a metaphor for how a person finds life. We have to pick up the cross and follow Jesus. Life can only be found if we die. It's so ironic. Now, I'm not saying suicide. I'm clearly not talking physical death. I don't want you to become a statistic that we have looked at earlier today. But whenever we look at this, there is something that has to come to an end within us in order for us to embrace the ways of Jesus. I love how um, the blues singer Albert King said, he says, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Is how Albert King phrased it. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, this is how Christ would call a man. He says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and to die. You see, here it is. This is God's will for you, according to this passage. In order for you to find life, you have to die. Uh, it, It sounds crazy. I know, I understand people have wrestled with this passage over and over again, but it's plain truth stands out to us. Unless our desires and our ambitions and our thoughts and our dreams and our ways are abandoned for God's, we will never find the life that we're looking for. We cannot. I think perhaps put another way, we might understand it better. If Peter had succeeded in talking Jesus out of the way of suffering, what would that mean for us? Even if if Peter was completely good intention, let's assume for a moment Peter's only uh, intentions in pulling Jesus to the side was to spare his friend from harm. But what if Jesus would have listened to that? Uh, What what if Peter were like, listen, for once, Jesus, think of yourself. Uh, You've done all of these wonderful things, you know, for others. Just for once, think of yourself. It's not possible that God's plan for you could be pain. God wouldn't want pain. God doesn't want pain for anyone. What if Peter had phrased things like that and Jesus had listened? What would the end result of that be? Well, my friends, Jesus would have rejected God's plan for him. There would be no payment for our sins. There would be no forgiveness of our sins. In fact, God could not look on us with kindness because without our sins paid for, there's only wrath from God reserved for us. You see, the cost of Jesus thinking of himself first would have been the eternal death of us all. Praise God that Jesus listened to the will of the Father instead of the will of Peter. You see, to find life, we must choose God's will of dying to ourself over our own plans for our life. It is not possible to follow Jesus and not count that cost. So what is God's will for us? The scriptures tell us in various places. I want us to uh, close with these two verses from the scriptures. Uh, Galatians chapter 1 verse 4 says, uh, Who gave himself, this is referring to Jesus, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. You see, Jesus went to the cross because it was God's good plan because of his love for us that he would pay for our sins instead of us paying for them. That was the good and gracious plan of our Heavenly Father. Thank goodness Jesus was obedient to it. So now, after it has been done and accomplished, His goal and his will for us is that we would be delivered from the present evil age by receiving the payment of Jesus on our behalf and living our lives according to the will of God. Now, I imagine when Paul wrote those words to Galatians, the church in Galatia, they were experiencing a time of difficulty. Uh, Isn't it amazing how that verse speaks directly to us today? I mean, it sounds as if it was written today to deliver us from this present evil age. Uh, My friends, to deliver us from this mess is not our self-preservation, but to seek what God wants from us in this time. Romans 6.23, I shared part of that verse this morning. I did not share the best part of it, so I will do that now. 6.23 of Romans says, For the wages of sin is death. All of us have earned 
death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. All of us have earned death, and yet the price has been paid by Jesus for those who will walk the narrow way. I want to close with this thought. I always ask, what about us? Uh, Before I say what I think we need to ask from ourselves, I want to tell you what this sermon was not intended to do. Uh, That might sound odd, uh, but I think you'll understand in just a moment. Uh, This sermon was not designed for you to decide whether you should wear a mask or not. That was not how I designed this sermon to go. It was also not intended to answer the question of whether you should send your kids to in-person instruction or not. That was not what I had intended to set out. It was also not meant to make people feel that if they do not attend services in person, that they are a cowardly Christian. That is not what I intended from this message. However, it is designed for you to understand that avoiding risk or even avoiding death is not the goal of the Christian life. The goal of the Christian life is obedience to the will of God, regardless of the cost and regardless of whether the world understands it or not. That's what we are called to So I will close with this question. Are you willing to embrace the risk-filled life of following Jesus? This is what he calls us to, and each of us for ourselves must make up our own minds if we are going to be obedient to what the Lord has said to us. Uh, Peter would uh, eventually have a, a tremendous transformation of understanding and being obedient, even when it would cost him and cost him his own life. May we have such faith in these times to be obedient because of the love that God has shown for us. Let's close this morning in prayer. God, we want to thank you for your word, how it brings truth to us, how it challenges us. God, how it calls us to submit ourselves to you. Jesus has made quite clearly to us that unless we embrace the will of God, unless we die to ourselves, we cannot find life. God, that that goes against our own nature, and you know that because we need something better than our nature. God, we need to be made new by you. God, I pray for those in this room that have received you, that you would continue to grow and to move and to work in their lives and give them the answers to the day-to-day questions that they have now. God, may they live with boldness, not trying to eliminate the risks of life, but, Father, to shine your light in the midst of them. God, for those that may have not received you, God, I pray that you would press upon them their need to do so because your closing words to your disciples is that they needed to choose because the time to be held accountable is coming. Father, we're closer to it now than they were when they heard those words. I pray if there's someone that needs to decide to follow Jesus, they would do so this morning. God, again, we thank you for your word. We just pray that you will be pleased with the closing of our service. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. And amen. that Tim Wilson would close our service in prayer.
Amen.